evening. Fall is here. Amen to that. I hope everybody got to get outside a little bit today and enjoy this beautiful day that the Lord has made, uh, that we are all so privileged to rejoice and be glad in. Uh, like many of you, hopefully, uh, Marilette and I had a chance to take in one last burst of summer uh, during that unusually warm Labor Day, um, and we went to our very elite pool club, Nashville Shores, to spend Labor Day out there. Um, and we spent a lot of time there at what is very clearly the best part of any water park, of course, the Lazy River. And if you haven't been to Nashville Shores during the last week of summer, uh, let me just tell you, it's not quite as eventful as it is during the first week of summer. Uh, the staff has lost a lot of their enthusiasm for the very like energetic uh, ways that they check people in the pool, whatever that means. Um, and the kids are all visibly disappointed because they know they have to go to school the next day. They don't have three months left to take this in. Um, and there is this whole graveyard just chocked full of inner tubes that have burst throughout the summer. Uh, they must have been down to half as many tubes as they had uh, the first time we went out there back in May. And that means that when you get to the Lazy River at Nashville Shores during the last week of summer, uh, there's this really long line of people who are waiting to get an inner tube. There's plenty of room in the water. There's just not enough tubes. By the time you make it all the way through this long line and sit on the hot concrete barefoot for 20 minutes, and you finally get a tube, the minute and a half that it takes to go around the Lazy River doesn't really seem adequate enough. And so what do you do naturally? Well, you just kind of take a second lap and then a third one, and a fourth, and a fifth, on and on and on, not ever wanting to get off of the tube, this prized possession of a properly inflated piece of plastic. And every time we did another lap and went past the entrance and saw all the, the poor people sitting there without their tubes, I'm going to be honest with you, if you will not judge me, I felt pretty good about myself. <laughs> There, like the king of the ocean, sitting on my inflatable throne, passed by, looking just a little sad for these people. Woe to you, you poor tubeless folks. I was once one of you, I understand. But now here I am on my tube, and no, you can't have it yet. I felt smug, I felt superior, and it felt good. Now maybe you all are just much better people than I am, more empathetic people, but I do believe that there is a piece of everyone somewhere that makes ourselves feel good by thinking that other people are worse, worse than we are. If you haven't witnessed that lately or if that just doesn't apply to you, go to the airport and observe the little six-foot-long red carpet reserved for first-class passengers who walk past very quickly, looking with this little glean in their eye of feeling sorry for those of us who have C boarding group passes because they get to get on the plane before we do. You can see it at the airport, and unfortunately, sometimes you can see it at church. And that's the piece of our inevitable human nature that Jesus is speaking to in this parable that we just heard. The parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. One of the things I find comforting about this parable, maybe the only thing I find comforting about this parable, is that if it's old enough to be in the Bible, if Jesus is telling us this, then at least we can be certain that the problem of people feeling smug in church has been around since the beginning of church. It's always been there. And that's what Jesus is speaking to. The story, the Pharisee, the tax collector, the parable here is not as famous or well-known as the prodigal son or the good Samaritan, and yet it's still one that, if you grew up around church, is probably emblazoned on your heart, one that you've heard before. And if that's the case, then, like me, you might 
have this mildly bitter taste in the back of your throat when you hear that word Pharisee. Pharisee, oh, those people. We know about those people. This Pharisee in the story goes before the temple and gets up in front of all the people there praising God for what? Praising God for not making him like all the other people, like all the other sinners who were there. Thank you, God, for not making me like them. And then comes along a lowly tax collector. And people that Jesus would have been speaking to back then, of course, uh, much like us today, don't really love tax collectors. In fact, I thought uh, about calling the sermon originally uh, Me, Myself, and IRS Auditors, um, but I just thought that would keep too many people away from church. People didn't love tax collectors then any more than they do now. But back then, not only did people not like them, but they made their living by taking more taxes than were owed to them. In other words, stealing whatever their income was supposed to be. But this lowly tax collector, this friend of Caesar's, who makes a living robbing other people, gets before the temple and quietly, it says, off in the distance away from everyone else, just kind of simply says, Lord, have mercy on me. How many of us think that to ourselves when we walk into church? Lord, have mercy on me. This is one of the most powerful parables, I think. But if it's one of the most powerful parables, it's also one of the most perilous. It's the only parable that I know of, of that long list that we saw last week. Sixty parables. It's the only one that I know of that just by hearing it, we fall victim to precisely what Jesus is warning against. If you're like me, I jump straight to figuring out all of the things that the Pharisees done wrong and how I have not, do not, and will not ever do those things. How did the Pharisees screw up and how can I avoid it? But the oversimplification of Pharisee, bad, tax collector, good, leads us so ironically to react to the story by saying, thank you, God, for not making me like the Pharisee. In other words, we're doing the very same thing that the Pharisee is doing. The irony, though, is usually lost on us. Without an abundance of caution, hearing this parable produces the very same thing that we're being warned against. The same superiority of a tube-bearing minister jerk or a red carpet diva rushing past the rest of us. That same sense of superiority is what we get by looking at the Pharisee. Thank you for not making me like you. If we walk away from this story with that mildly bitter taste for the Pharisees, or for Pharisees in general, we have missed the moral of the story. That any one of us, no matter how faithful or how religious or how spiritual or how church-going we may or not be, any one of us is capable of thinking that somehow we are better than someone else in the eyes of God. The problem with seeing other people as better or worse is that we fail to honor the equal share of the image of God that exists inside every single person we encounter the equal share of God, the image of God that they were made in. I don't know if any of you all caught Stephen Colbert's show this week. I was watching at home alone on Friday night because my wife's out of town. Um, And he interviewed Vice President Biden, who shared something that his mom told him when he was growing up. Biden said, no one is better than you, but you're better than no one. And that really stuck with me, and having put all this time into writing my sermon, I thought, 
wow, that's really my whole sermon in three seconds, and then these people have to sit for another 10 minutes and listen to me. (laughs) But that's what Jesus is teaching us. Nowhere in this story does Jesus make the point that everything the Pharisee does is wrong. The Pharisee tithes, the Pharisee fasts, the Pharisee does things that the Bible asks us to do and goes above and beyond. Jesus never says that the Pharisee was mistaken for tithing or fasting. And nowhere in the story does Jesus say that this presumed robbery of the tax collector is worthy to be praised. The issue here is not who these people are, it's what's in their head. The issue here is the mistaken notion that some of us are entitled to come before God, worthy enough of His mercy, and that others of us should be pushed aside to make room for us. We profess week after week in reading the Scripture and wrestling with how God speaks to us. We profess week after week to serve a God of abundant grace and mercy and unfailing love and compassion and understanding. While at the very same time, many of us, myself included, live our lives in a way that just shows judgment to other people. It doesn't add up. We're not the same people Monday through Friday that we try to be on Sunday. But I find no coincidence in this story that Jesus chooses, and keep in mind, parables are made up, right? Jesus gets to pick any of the details that he wants. Jesus chooses a house of worship for the setting of this parable. It's no coincidence. Fair or not, there are a lot of people in the world who look at this church and based on nothing more than the shape of our building think that because we're a church, we must be judgmental. Now, that may be false, but we have to work very hard to profess that it's not true. Hopefully, there is a part of you, as there is a part of me, that squirms a little bit when we hear this story. Say, that's not me, that's not us. Thank goodness, I'm not like the Pharisee. Thank goodness, we're not like all those other churches, all those other religious people that Jesus was warning us to watch out for without ever stopping to ask the question whether we're those people sometimes. So there we go again. Thank you, God, that I'm not that way. Thank you for not making me like that mean old Pharisee. Thank you for not making us just like everybody else. We are righteous. We are worthy. I think it's a right and fine thing to come to church. I really do. But if we walk in the doors with those judgments, we might as well have stayed at home. I find it hard to imagine that at a Christmas Eve worship service, for instance, that God listens more attentively to the prayers of the people who come week after week on that day than He does to the people who came for the first time since Easter. And yet, in our head, those tax collectors took our seat. There is a piece of each of us, whether we admit it or not, whether we're aware of it or not, there is a piece of us that is capable of being the Pharisee, and there's a piece of us that's capable of being tax collector. It's like that old Native American proverb that you may have heard before. The proverb of the grandfather telling his grandson of two wolves that exist within each one of us. He says, my son, there is a terrible fight within each of us, and it's between two wolves. One is evil. He is anger, envy, sorrow, regret, greed, self-pity, guilt, resentment, false pride, superiority, and ego. But he continued, the other of those two wolves 
is good. He has joy, peace, love, understanding, acceptance, benevolence, empathy, generosity, truth, and goodness. My grandson worried about this power, these two powers that exist within him. Say, Grandfather, which of these two win? And he says, the one that you feed. Each one of us, indeed, has some of the Pharisee and some of the tax collector. But in this parable, Jesus is simply asking us, which one do we feed? Will you pray with me? Holy One, we come before you tonight asking for mercy upon us quietly. We know that sometimes we fall short, more often than not, and yet you look upon us and say that you are worth saving, that there is a piece of you that is good, that is worth feeding. Lord, help us to receive your mercy, that we may pass it on to all those we encounter without fear, without judgment. Amen.